Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. This is my counsel. Thank you for joining us. In the spotlight is Melanie Benjamin. Hi, I am Melanie Benjamin. I'm a New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction. Uh, I've had seven books published, an eighth coming out in August, and you may know me from such books as uh, The Aviator's Wife, The Swans of Fifth Avenue, Alice I Have Been, Mistress of the Ritz, and my most recent novel was The Children's Blizzard, and I'm so happy to be here. Seven novels in 11 years. You're you're quite productive, Melanie. Did I get that yeah. right? Seven and 11. Yeah, I think so. And then you've got- 2010 was the first one, and then this is, and the last one came out. Um, in 2020. So it was really seven in 10 years, really. And then you've got the new one uh, coming mm-hmm. out next mm-hmm. in 2023. Now you right. have written about some really interesting subjects. The Aviator's Wife was made into a movie, was it not? No. I, no oh, it sure novel. sounds like it. <laughs> no. I'm mixing it up with another Hollywood sure, film, but. No. <laughs> I always a bridesmaid, never a bride in Hollywood for me. <laughs> well, there's still time. I mean, that you've got Anne Morrow Lindbergh as a character there. The Swans of Fifth Avenue, Truman Capote, who yeah, was about as an electric. that was closest, but it. Oh, um, did it? Oh, three times we got so close. Um, and this time it was killed forever by um, an upcoming season of Feud. No, is it Feud? Yeah, Feud with uh, Capote. They, they, uh, not, they actually, um, whoever does Feud, Ryan Murphy, um, is using another book that is not my book. Um, a more recent nonfiction book, which I shall not, I will not name it. Um, and nor should so, you. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, I think a dagger in the heart, finally, again, so, so close every time, but. Well, another one that just is, is, I think is crying to be made. And I see, I already see the actress who will play it. We'll compare notes here. It's mistress okay. of the Ritz, oh, uh, yeah. the story of an American woman who ran the Ritz during World War II, catering to the Nazi occupiers by day while working for the resistance by night. Mm-hmm. I've got an actress in mind. Do you do you know who you'd want to play this role? If I, I'm always hesitant to say it in case that's not the actress, if it ever happens. Do you mind I if I say it? No, what go a, ahead. And, and I, I say have, I, Kate Blanchett. Oh, yes, that's it. Yeah. Are exactly. you serious? I'm serious. Is serious, that who you had serious. in mind? Yeah, she's perfect Absolutely. for it. No, I didn't have it in mind when I was writing it. I don't do it that. I don't do that. But, you know, on the rare occasions when you, you know, I, again, I have been so jaded by Hollywood. I, I so rarely ever let myself dream anymore. <laughs> well, look, but, at, um, we so many of us are jaded the by one. the book industry, right? We're all jaded. Uh, not not everybody. You've been very successful with it. But there's so many of us jaded by the book industry. You get in the book industry, Hollywood comes, you know, maybe sniffing around, but ends up... Yeah frustrating people and I actually and I you know I have a dear friend whose book is actually being made into a movie now Edward Kelsey Moore who I do a podcast with and he's my best friend and um he's got his first book is being literally is actually being made into a movie and um so I'm so happy for him so you know know, there are there are but you know we he and I talk about it the thing is um, one thing that irritates me as a writer is that the first thing people ask if when you have a new book out is, will it be a movie? Or in these days, will it be, you know, a, a exactly. streaming, you know, uh, limited, limited series? I, I, and, I'm guilty of that. Did I just do that to you? Well, <laughs> I no, thought the I like it. I mean, Life was a movie. <laughs> it, it's kind of, to me, it's like the book should be enough, right? Why is a book a success only if it gets you know, embraced by Hollywood. Yeah. A book should be a success without that. So it's just something that having done this for many, many years, (laughs) it's just one of those things that over time has turned into a, um, I try to hide it, but it it truly annoys me when that's the first thing somebody asks when you say, I'm with you. I am with you. You know, I've said before, I'll say it again. You know, it's not just that the book is bigger. It's more, it's more detailed. It has to do with the fact that when you're in a theater, the director makes all the decisions. And oh, you, yeah. You, you have no input. You have no yeah. play. You yeah. have no play. It, with a gonna, book, you're, you're gotta, co-creating the actual story with the author. The book, yes. the book, And the book is my creation. And, you know, again, I would be thrilled to dip. Kate Blanchett, if you're listening, <laughs> you would be perfect. <laughs> I, I mean, truly, really, I did always think she would be great. But um, 
it's that wouldn't be my creation anymore. It would be based on my creation, which is has yes. to be enough for the and, author. And, and look, yeah. if once most authors, it seems that when they do have a book made into a movie, they don't really like the final outcome anyway. It's oftentimes um, it's very difficult for Hollywood to to deliver on expectations because they have so little. Now, I will say this. The streaming has changed that a lot because now you can have episode, multiple episodes. You can have multiple sure. seasons. So now you can get into some real detail. Well, they almost have to go beyond a book in some cases. Exactly. Right? You exactly. Know, That's what like, they did with the yeah. uh, game. Uh, what was it? Uh, what am game I of thinking Thrones. of? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. He and, couldn't and write fast enough. So they no, had to get a right. whole team of people writing episodes. Right. But, um, you know, it has been a golden era of, and people always say that to me, but well, surely with all these limited series, content is king. It's a, it's a glut right now. I mean, there's too much and there, biz, there were huge delays with the pandemic of things being in production right now. So a lot of they're, they're backed up right now in Hollywood. Yeah. So it's not as golden of an age as people might want to think it is from the creative content side. Well, and, and streaming's kind of hit the rocks uh, lately. But yeah, there are um, some issues right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to go away, but it's, it's 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 run into financial problems. I mean, there's so much competition there and there's and only so much time. Yeah. And I am consistently told that historical fiction is the hardest thing to get made. Oh, is that uh, right? Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. This is what film agents have told me. <laughs> Well, and if they had things change all the time, though, if they hadn't already made the movie Capote, uh, which was an excellent movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, I think maybe Swans of Fifth Avenue would have. Uh, uh, we got so close. There, I mean, I can tell you that the first time it was uh, optioned by Brett Ratner's company with a, an actress uh, attached, Bryce Dallas Howard. And we, I, you know, had the phone call saying we're going to announce a deal next week with HBO. And that is when exactly when Brett Ratner's Me Too or how, you know, reckoning for sexual abuse happened and the whole company oh, no. disbanded. So that was the first thing that was, you know, the first blow. But then it got picked up by a company that that got some of his assets. And um, but unfortunately, um, they're they never had a screenwriter attached and someone was trying to write the script herself who really shouldn't really have been doing it but it went a long way and then things were looking up and then we got wind of something going on with Naomi Watts with mm. something else and they and they kind of wanted to option the book but, but only as additional source material it was not going to be credited it was not going to be based on the novel The Swans of Fifth Avenue and without that credit it there's no need I mean it means nothing to me to have my book option so we said no to that and then that kind of disbanded and then just very very recently um we had really good screenwriters attached and a really good production company with a deal with one of the produce uh, big um studios and things are moving along and my deal was done and they were working on the deal for the screenwriters and then this thing happened with ryan murphy's thing um with naomi watts so i i i, I suspect it's an offshoot of a previous deal that killed me that was like so that's three strikes right there you yeah, know yeah and and this is not now it's not going to happen it, it just won't there you, know, you can't have something that too similar they really did try the people who had optioned it the, the writers loved it and were really and and talked with the big studio to see if there was a way we could move forward with this other you know other thing going on and and ultimately they couldn't which i understand 100 percent. but it was just my heart got stomped on three freaking times I with this know. one novel <laughs> well you, yeah 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 well now with mistress of the ritz if uh kate blanchett was to be offered the role and she said i'm just too busy i i can't i can't imagine her turning it down because it sounds perfect for her but if she yes, did i would say jessica chastain would be a good alternate right there She'd be good. I could also see Nicole Kidman, maybe. I could see that too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'd be a real change for her, but I think she likes to stretch herself as an actress. I saw her yes. in Nashville this weekend. I was in line between behind her and Keith Urban. Was she stunning? <laughs> was she stunning or, or, or I not? Think she, the weird thing is that I noticed him first because I just walked in and I was around the corner from my hotel and it wasn't even in down. It wasn't it wasn't like by the operating it was kind of out by Vanderbilt anyway as I, I was in town researching for another new, a new novel and um 
I, I walked in and I saw this guy in front of me and I said, boy, he really looks like Keith Urban. <laughs> There's a good reason why. <laughs> then I noticed that everybody around me was kind of hushed. And then I went, oh my God, that is Keith Urban. And then I looked, and then next to him was a very tall, thin, pale woman. But I don't think I would have noticed her had I not noticed him, which is very odd. I mean, he just looks so completely like himself, you know, but she had her hair back and, you know, and they were with their daughter and everyone was very respectful. And I, I didn't notice anybody taking pictures or anything. I actually had to reach around them to get my coffee order. It was funny. But um, I don't know. That was kind of fun. I love celebrity sightings. <laughs> well, and you have a background and you have theatrical training. So the, yeah. the whole Hollywood or stage thing, this all is part and parcel of your fiber. So yeah. I can understand why, you know, you're writing uh, uh, novels and you want to see it brought to, you want to see it dramatized. That's, well, that's a, I mean, it'd be that was nice. your first love was theater, according to your bio. That's true. It was. Um, I wanted to be an actress and wasn't one of those people who wanted to be an author. But um, I was always a, a reader, for sure. A big, big time reader. How did and, you become? Um, finish that and then tell me how you became an author. What well, made you think? Um, it's, a, it's a story I tell a lot because it's about, you know, you can you can you can be a late bloomer. And I certainly was. Um you know, I did theater, but my parents really didn't support that as a um, college option. I wanted to go to New York to study the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. They would not they would not do it. They wouldn't give me the money to do it. And I wish I'd been able to do it on my own. You know, I wish I'd had the strength I have now. I wish I'd had that at 18, but I didn't. And um, so I went to a college where I had a, I was a National Merit Scholarship scholar and I had a, a scholarship to college, but it didn't have a theater program which was what I, why did I even go? So I, I dropped out. I mean, it was just, and then I did a lot of theater and then I got married and then I had kids and I was a PTA mom and I stopped doing theater sometime in my thirties. It just, I kind of lost that spark. And a dear friend of mine said, when I was right around the age of 40, she said, I always thought you'd be a writer. And she doesn't know why she said that. Hmm. <laughs> That's Interesting. Because I really don't know. And she remembers that, but she doesn't know why she said it. But when she said it, it was kind of like a light bulb went off over my head because um, I always, well, I think the imagination required to be an actress is, is exactly the same kind of imagination you need as a novelist. You need to be able to be other people. And in Precisely. the case of a novelist, lots of other people. Um, <laughs> so I, I really, I, I used to say, well, you know, I used to um, act on the pay stage and now I act on the page. I mean, I truly am becoming these people when I'm writing about them. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, it was, it was kind of scary how easy it was for me to become Truman Capote, I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, boy, um, you're drinking a lot and, yeah, and no, carousing a lot. <laughs> I just truly understood him. I really got into that. Um, so then, but I'd also, I'd never really taken, I think maybe one creative writing class freshman year college before I dropped out. But I was always very, very good at writing in school. It was always the essay test or the essay portion or the book report you had to write that you know got me the easy a plus I never thought about it I had a huge vocabulary and that comes from being um a young reader I think um yes yes and I and I and I just I think you have to have a talent I think you can be taught certain things um but I think innately you have to have a talent for telling a story yeah. a really good story and you have to have an easy you know a a complete grasp of grammar and spelling and mechanics. I mean, that's a must. And those are things that can kind of be taught, but not everybody wants to be taught them. And, no. um, and not so, everybody has facility for that. I mean, yeah, 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 grammar can be taught, but but when it comes to storytelling or turning a phrase, a lot of people just don't have a facility and, for that. And, and the ability to write different kinds of sentences, you know, complex yes. sentences, simple sentences sentences, compound sentences, and the ability to instinctly vary pacing. your sentence structure, pacing, yeah. right, not a narrative. Um, well, you, you grew know, up in Indianapolis, know. which has an yeah. uh, you know, excellent school system. So you learned all of the basics, uh, all the blocking and tackling you must have learned. It's a basketball state, not a football state. So I shouldn't say blocking and tackling. <laughs> it is a, it is a uh, basketball you're, you're a Hoosier. You're a Hoosier. Yeah. You probably played a little basketball yourself growing up. Well, no, but we certainly had the basketball goal on the side of the garage like everybody does. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you live in Chicago now with your husband, a wonderful mm -hmm. Chicago. Mm -hmm. Can your husband tell the difference when you've had a good or bad writing day? 
he just can tell the difference whether when I'm running period. Um, what is the he difference? Knows, he, well, he just, I get extremely, he can, he can carry on a conversation with me and I can be looking at him and I will not hear a word he said. Um, oh, you're I'm, in, I'm in my head. head. Yeah. I require a, an enormous amount of space to be in my own head when I'm writing. Um, I'm not one of these people and I admire them, but I'm not who could have a day job and write at the same time. I, I, I have to be living with them all the time. So I get very vague, <laughs> I get very um, You're consumed. Ab- you know, yeah, absent minded. I'm not always responsive to him, which is, you know, he understands. Um, you know, he he'll tell me something and I and I, I will not remember it. Um, that's the that's what he picks up on. That's what he knows. And, and you I want to be consumed, right? That's a state of of being oh, that you me, enjoy. That's the, yeah, that's the attraction of writing for me. Yeah. Um, but I don't have bad writing days. I have to say, I, I don't get hung up. I don't, I've never had writer's block because I firmly believe you, you, it, that only happens if you start writing too soon. I, I have a story in my head. I may not sit down and plot it out like some people do, you know, using a big old uh, whiteboard kind of a thing, I don't, but I certainly, but the, the novel, I, I went to no, uh, Nashville to research, um, I've got this story in my head to the point where I'm ready to write now. I can't wait to write. But if I had started writing two months ago when I came upon the idea, that's when you run into writer's block because you don't know what you don't know the story that you're telling. Yeah, but it's I, all in my head now and I can't wait to get it out on the page. So that means I'm not going to have any bad writing days because I also trust myself. Um, if I also know that everything I write is not going to end up in the final version because I'm, I revise so I'm not so worried about my first draft because I know that if I have to, I can replace those words with better ones. I just have a lot of confidence in that ability. So yeah. I don't always, I mean, I just sit down writing, knowing one, the story that I'm going to tell, knowing that it may, may the writing may take me in directions I hadn't planned for sure. I love that when that happens, but also, you know, if what I write today isn't very good, I can, I can, I can replace it with something that's better. Exactly. Yeah, I've never had an issue with writer's block. I mean, I'm I'm a talker. I'm uh, and I'm I just it, it comes out of me. Also, I remember I had an English teacher many many years ago. I mean, it was uh, junior high school. So I remember his name, Mr. Gallagher, and he said if somebody had come to him about writer's block, and he said, "Do you go to the library? You pull." four or five books off the shelf that interest you, you sit down and you start reading a little bit of them and, mm-hmm. and it will come. It just, it, you just, uh, it, it ignites you. Now, yeah, I, I don't know if that can be said for everybody, but it's certainly- Well, I do, I, I do read a lot while I write. Um, it, and I'm always puzzled by writers who tell me, oh, I don't have time to read because I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book now. Well, I, I don't believe in that. I came to this as a love, from a love of reading. I was a reader first. And I also think that if you have talent, you will learn an awful lot by reading other people's books. Um, and so I am just inspired. When I read an amazing book, when I'm in the middle, it doesn't make me, it, I, I don't worry that I'm going to copy the voice. I, don't, I have a lot of self-confidence in my own voice. So I don't worry about that. I don't worry that I'm going to plagiarize. I don't worry that it's going to stifle me. I just get inspired to push myself to be a better writer and can't wait to get back the next what day. What is your writing. voice? Describe your voice. Well, it your depends with the, you know, it voice. For me, it changes with every book. Okay. So you don't have a singular voice. You're not just. I don't think I do. Okay. I don't, maybe other people could see it. You know, I don't think an author can always see that. Mm-hmm. We're too close to it. I think the voice comes with each book because each book is a different setting, a different situation, a different bunch of people. Um, and each book requires a different way of telling it. Right, some books, tonality. Re- yeah, yeah, some books can be, you know, be told fairly straightforward. Some books need a little zing and pizzazz. I mean, I think the Swans of the Avenue had a lot of pizzazz to it. You know, I kept thinking that I was a part at a party while I was writing this book, you know, and that <laughs> it was this kind of a thing that was in my head. So it had a certain zing to it. Yes. Um, even though it was multiple points of view and each one of those, I think, I know was unique among, you know, that they, they didn't, they didn't all sound the same, but overall the book had a zing to it that would not have been appropriate for the aviator's wife. 
that had to be more reflective. Your novels have been translated into more than 15 different languages. So other than the United States, do you know where you sell best on a per capita basis? Um, I've done pretty well in Italy and France. Um, I don't know. And then, of course, then the pandemic hit. Uh, Mistress of the Ritz would have been an enormous book in France had the pandemic not happened. And um, it came out right in the first few months of the pandemic. And I know I had a, I had a, some lovely press there and, and I did some press there and, you know, you, with interviews through the phone and everything for some of the major newspapers, but their pandemic meant that they had to close the bookstores. And France does not have um, a huge online book selling industry, not like we do here. Right. So that kind of hurt that book for sure. Cause I think, you know, they had huge hopes for it. Swans had done really, really well um, there. And they had huge hopes for Mr. Zarisk because obviously it's set in Paris. Um, but so I, I would say France and Italy, I think mm-hmm. for the most part. Two and countries with uh, are steeped in history, of course. Yeah. And it also depends on the book too. I mean, to be honest, some books of mine have not done well in any country because maybe they're not, they're maybe a little too American. You know, I, right. I don't know. I, it's hard to, you know, the foreign market is always a tough nut to crack regardless. I've never been published in the UK. Um, and, it, you know, I, it's, it's hard to say what kind of books from American writers they're going to embrace. It's really, yes. it's really hard to say. Now, um, you, I, your name ahead. is a pseudonym, right? Melanie Benjamin is a pseudonym? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mel- Melanie Hauser. Did I recall that correctly? Name. Yeah, so it's it's no big mystery. I was actually published in the early 2000s, um, two books for Penguin under my real name, Melanie Lindhauser. I had to use my middle name. And those books didn't do well at all. Um, and I really I found myself, uh, there's a saying that it's harder to stay published than it is to get published. And I found that to be true at that point in my career. And I str- I, those books were not books that I would have wanted to read myself. I wasn't writing the right kind of book. I can say that very honestly. Um, I should have been writing historical from the beginning, but I just didn't know it. Um, And it took me several attempts before I did find what I should have been doing all along, which was historical fiction. And I wrote Alice I Have Been, um, my first historical. But I did, obviously, at that point, it had been years since I'd had a contract. So I didn't know that this book was going to be published. I just fell in love with the story. My agent at the time who had stuck with me through all that um, really liked the story. And when I, I wrote the whole book, you know, not knowing that it would be published. And when she went out with it, she was the one who suggested a pseudonym to give me a fresh start in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, your sales figures are attached to your name. <laughs> and, and when a brand is not successful, sometimes you get a rebrand. And that's what I did. So I, I just, took the name of uh, one of my sons um, that it just kind of fit. So that's, that's how. Oh, I okay. Interesting. Okay. So Benjamin, you have a son, yeah, Benjamin. Somebody, someone very smart told me, keep your first name because it gets confusing enough. So make sure you're not going to become Sue, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, good. people are talking to you and you're not answering. But um, so the, uh, so that was really smart. And um, the Benjamin, I thought worked. It sounded good. So that's now, it. Low in the alphabet, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, a, that's, I, that's a consideration, and, too. And yeah. at the time, also, I could get a, web, a website domain. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't taken. So that was also a big Good consideration point. Back, at, back at that time. Yeah. Good point. So I heard you say that uh, I never want to write the same book twice. Uh, I, I mean, on one hand, obviously, we don't want to write the same book twice. But um, elaborate on that. What What do you mean by that? Well, I've, some people, I've, I've, I've been asked many times if I, don't you want to write a sequel about, I don't know who, the, you know, Mrs. Tom Thumb, that one comes up a lot, or um, The Children's Blizzard, actually, if several people have asked me, you know, wouldn't you, would you ever want to write a sequel? So, so I think maybe that was an answer to that. It is, no, I don't. I don't want to keep, I, I want to write something new. I mean, I'm always I, I don't want to stay with the same subject or the same characters for more than one book. I personally, liter- I guess I have literary ADHD. I just couldn't do it. But uh, beyond that, um, I kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking about voice. Um, 
each, I want every book to sound different, to read different. I don't want every book. I don't want someone to pick up a Melanie Benjamin book and know what they're going to get. I mean, yes, to some extent, they will know that it's a historical novel, that it's, you know, got that you're going to learn some things about history that you didn't know, whether or not I'm writing about real people. And I'm not in my next book or the book, book after that. It is still about a real time period and real issues. And they were women's issues. So it will always have a female, you know, bent to it. I guess those are things you will always know. But beyond that, I want you to be surprised every time by how it's structured, by what the point of view is or what you know, is it first person? Is it third person? Is it, you know, alternating points of view? I don't want you to to know what you're going to pick up beyond the fact, like I said, it's historical and it's going to have a woman's point of view, most likely. Do you consider yourself a genre writer? Well, yes. You do. Uh, Okay. Uh, But 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 you're, you're trying to establish a lot of diversity within the genre. You don't want to keep... Right. I mean, historical fiction is a big umbrella, right? And under a big tent and un- beneath it, there's lots of different kinds of historical fiction. And the, the genre that I help popularize, I will take credit for that because I've been told that by booksellers, is this biographical historical fiction, okay. um, which is generally a woman, a real woman who lived and a historical novel about that woman. And it's not biograph, it's not biography, and it's not history. It's not nonfiction. I mean, we are fictionalizing these stories, but based on a lot of research about these people. And since I started writing that back in 2010, and there were a couple other authors like Paula McLean, who were who started doing it then, it became extremely popular. And there, I think, were been too many books in this particular genre of you're getting crowded. It's, it now. is crowded and it's not quite as popular as it was. And it's probably because it's too crowded. So I, um, again, always looking to search and stretch and talking to, uh, I have a new agent who I'm very excited about. I'm working with and talking with my editor at Random House, you know, it's like, I need to, I need to keep one step ahead. I, I don't want to be stale. I don't want to be lost in the crowd of all these other historical biographical historical fictions. I still love history. I can say I cannot imagine myself writing a contemporary novel, but I wanted to do something different this time. And that is where, well, I guess I did start with the children's blizzard. um, I'm sorry, I need to correct myself, where I took a real event in that case and fictionalized the characters so that none of the people I wrote about were real, you know. But the event um, was real. But the real, the event was real. Um, with the new my novel that comes out in August called California Golden, I'm taking a cultural moment, which was California in the late 50s, early 60s, particularly the surf culture, and inventing characters who will experience that pop culture moment and also the counterculture moment going on at the same time throughout the 1960s. And, and it's a story of two girls, two sisters and their mother, who their mother was a um, championship. Again, I'm making this up. There are some real women of that time period that I am inspired by, but this is not their story. I'm making everything up. But uh, so this is about a woman um, who doesn't want to be Donna Reed. She wants to be Gidget, basically, which is not what a mother was supposed to do in the 1950s and how her choice affected her daughters. And how, you know, so they're all kind of in the same area, but then the the daughters kind of strike out on their own. And one becomes caught up in celebrity of California at that time. And the other one gets kind of sucked into the counterculture with with cults and drugs. And um, it's about generational trauma, but it's also about sisters and mothers and set against the whole sweeping 1960s era. You've got Vietnam and everything in there. So right, it's a the, little bit more sweeping. The Manson and, family and yeah, the drug culture. And, and, yeah, and you know, the Beach Boys and Whiskey A Go Go and the Frankie and Nat <laughs> movies too. You got it all. But it's because it's such a fascinating era. But again, I wanted to tell about women trying to compete in a men's in- world because surfing was and remains a very sexist sport very racist sport too. And, and there's, and we, we get involved in that in the book as well. 
Um, but it is still a story about sisters and mothers and forgiveness and love um, set against this kind of more sweeping background. And so that's me pushing myself a little bit more. So it's still very much historical fiction. Yeah, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's historical, yeah. but it's it's fairly contemporary, it's, you know, and it's it set is, here it in is. the United it's, States. It yeah. reads more contemporary. It reads sexier, I will say for sure. Um, and I think I need that right now um, because there's a Why lot of young that? people. Well, because oh. there are a, a lot of young people reading who have not read my books. Good and idea. Not, yeah, I get yeah, it. And might not be at this point compelled to pick up one of the older titles, um, and I want. To, I don't want my um, readership to age out. And I think I'm um, in, I don't want to alienate my prior readers for sure, but I do want to capture a wider audience, which I think anyone who's in this business should want to do. Yes, yes. So is there a favorite, whether real or fictionalized, is there a favorite character that you wrote? Wow, that's a good question. I loved Blanche in Mistress of the Ritz. Mm. Um, she was a hoot, <laughs> despite the you know obvious uh, you know the the tragedies that she witnessed in being you know when she was she was imprisoned by the Nazis. She was still quite a hoot, quite a dame. You know, uh, you know it was a drinking buddy of Hemingway. And Fitzgerald <laughs> in, in Paris in the 20s. It's like, you know, that's just great. I loved her. And as I mentioned, I really enjoyed writing about Truman Capote. Yeah. Um, I really, really did. He was also kind of a hoot, despite, again, there, you know, his his demons and um the sadness of his childhood, which I really, really tried to bring out in that book, because I'm not sure a lot of people realize that. Um I, I love every character I write about. You yeah. know, it's certain like, ones are more maybe yeah, a little more exhilarating. Yeah. When you look back, I, I loved Mrs. Tom Thumb. I have to say that was probably my least successful book, but um, I loved her. I loved her courage and her gumption and her desire to see the world and not be defined by her what other people saw as limitations. Um, I really, really, really liked her. So there are characters and then there's eras. So if you were to be reincarnated, what era would you want to be placed in? Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on writing in the 50s and 60s right now for the next couple of books, um, which is fun. Um, but I would want to, I always had an affinity for the 1920s. Mm. Uh, I would, I never really wrote a book in that setting. Which in, country? In, in, which country would you oh, want to be? I, you know, totally, I would want to be in France in the twenties. Yeah, uh, in Paris specifically, that whole, um, you know, lost generation kind of thing on uh, the left bank in Paris um, has always appealed very much to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, along the way, Melanie, have you ever been reading your stuff and saying, you know, I'm starting to see this. Um, repetition, this trick I use, this turn of phrase is I mean, I mean, I saw that in 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 Melissa Gilbert's book, Eat, Pray, Love, which was a great book, but she had this little Elizabeth device. Gil you mean Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert. Thank you for that correction. Yeah. Elizabeth Gilbert. <laughs> and but there was a certain device she used over and over again. And I'm not sure if she was aware of it or not, but as a as a writer who's a reader, it was a little annoying to me. Mm. And I think we catch ourselves sometimes saying, This has become a pet uh, word or phrase, or there's just something that we're doing that uh, we're, we kind of trip over, we catch ourselves out. Has that happened to you over the years? Yeah, I don't often go back and reread my books. Um, but even in the why. process of, you know, well, when you go I, back and... Yeah, but if you've been doing this for 10 years and you've written, I mean, you only know seven books. I wrote at least two more that I didn't publish during that time because I just chose not to because mm -hmm. I didn't think they were good enough. Um, it's hard to remember what you did before. And I will say on the occasions when I have picked up a book of mine and just open it up to a page, I'm usually like, oh, my God, did I say that? I mean, I'm kind of impressed. It's like, I didn't know. I, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I That's a great feeling. That's a yeah, great feeling. That. Like, wow, boy, I must have been in, a, in a, an alpha brainwave good. frequency when I was doing this page. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I that's always I, a nice, nice thing. You know, I guess I rely on my editor to catch me out of most of those things. Um, well, that's I, a good point. Yeah, an editor. Yeah, that's, or a that's copywriter, um, copy editor. I mean, 
um, I don't, I think there was a time I used the word just a lot, but I've eliminated that a lot. And I don't think it ever ended up in a final copy. It was just, I remember from a first draft or a second draft, someone well, catching me out on that. One of the uh, wonders of technology is, you know, you can just search a manuscript oh, these days. Yeah. And I do, it's just and like, are, did I say this before? And I just yeah. search it and it's like, oh, that's, you know, I don't want to use it twice. And now I can go back to, you know, I, ideation. I, I, guess, I cannot answer your question. I can't come up with anything. I just No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I was I, just, that's good yeah. that, that you don't have anything to provide on not, that. But, Let me know, ask you this. If I think you could writers go, are good about knowing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you, knowing what you know now, what would you tell a 25-year-old Melanie Benjamin? Well, um, life is long and you have many, many chances to reinvent yourself. So don't think the world has ended just because, uh, you know, you, you didn't get to go to New York to be an actress. Well, that doesn't mean your life is over. Uh, I, do, I tell that to my kids a lot. Uh, it's like, you don't have to know what you're going to be for the rest of your life ever, ever. Yes. Do you have to know that you, you have the ability to reinvent yourself as many times as you want to. And I guess I would say that. And especially nowadays, because we live so much longer and healthier, most, not everybody, but if you take care of yourself, you live a healthy, long life. And there are a lot of people who have three lives in one, they have three careers in one life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. because you know yeah. it's kind of like hey i wanted to change a change of pace so i did it yeah so it's I mean, uh interesting i like that to, way. i like to tell people you know i wasn't published until i was like 45 i didn't get my first new york times bestseller until after i was 50 um i I'm, I'm happy to tell people that i want to tell young people that i don't want them to fear that they if they don't make the right decision at 18 that their life is stuck on a path they can never change yeah, I think it's really uh, an important message because it takes the pressure off. Yeah, yeah. I, Too often I, people or young people start in life and they think they have to pick something and it's something that, that you know, and they can't afford to make a bad choice because that's it for life. Right, and that is not true. And I am no. a walking, living, breathing, still evolving <laughs> <laughs> representation of that. I, you know, I, I, I first realized that that was an important thing to tell my own children when they were in middle school. And one of them, I can't remember which one, came to me very anxious about to start high school. And their guidance counselors were telling them in, in eighth grade, you need to know what you want to be because you need to be on that path in high school. Yeah. So if you're yeah. going to want to be a doctor now, you need to go in that path. If you want to be a lawyer, you, you need to know. And they were very this my son was quite anxious which I think a lot of teenagers are and mm -hmm. that's you know the first time I really kind of voiced that out loud to him and I said look at me and, and you know and look at your father I mean none of us neither of us ended up doing the thing we went to college for and you know one of us started really really late in life <laughs> yeah so, very common <laughs> yeah very common yeah, yeah. so you're a member of the Authors Unbound Speakers Bureau. Talk about that. What I, I'm not familiar with, with the Authors Unbound Speakers Bureau. Well, um, if you're lucky, and at some point, if you, you've achieved some kind of name in, in this business, people will want you to come and talk to their organizations yeah. <laughs> and groups, <laughs> and they will pay you to do so. So it's a Speakers and Bureau, but it's specific to authors. This is. Authors Unbound. Yes, there are other lecture bureaus out there and, you know, ones that are huge umbrella, you know, they have like the biggies, like the Clintons and the Obamas and, you know, mm -hmm. and but Authors Unbound is specific to authors and it not necessarily, you know, the, uh, the, the James Patterson kind of author, very successful authors, but maybe, you know, we're, we're not commanding, you know, the, the fees that Someone like yeah, you're Michelle not getting a hundred thousand in, uh, uh, no, in no, a luxury no, no, no. suite at the same time. No, but there are <laughs> a lot of organizations out there, and so others. What a good speaking bureau can do, and and others unbound certainly is that, is they you know they're out there um, meeting constantly, talking, meeting with organizations, people who love readers. I mean, people who love authors, right? Um, anyone who wants, you know, who who reads, who likes authors. They're plugged into that community and they know, I mean, certain, there are a lot of um, uh, lecture series 
yes. right? I've done several of them. Like the Thurber House has one, Atlanta. Um, there's an uh, organization in Atlanta that has one. The Dallas Art Museum is another. I've done a lot of those. And they're always looking for really enter- you know, entertaining authors to come in and speak. And so what other Authors Unbound does is they are plugged into that community and they know who's looking for who. And so they know their stable of authors. So they're pitching us out there. Yeah. They're doing something I can't do. You know, I can't go and pitch myself to every organization that might pay me to speak, but that's what they do. Yeah. And then they take care of the tough part of negotiating the fees and the travel and, and all that. Because, um, you know, authors, there's part of us that's like, wait, I'll pay you to let me come speak, which, you know, that's not right. <laughs> right, right. We need, to be, we need to be paid for our time, which is, I'll be honest, in this, in this world, not a lot of, there are an awful lot of people who will want you to do everything for free when it comes yes. to writing or talking about writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So and if, so if I think we should be paid and um, that's what they do. So if you are um, booked and they say, you know, we don't have anything specific in mind. We just, our, our audience wants to hear from an author and in, in, uh, mm-hmm. in your category. Uh, mm-hmm. What, tell us a little bit about what you have to talk about. What, what do you, emphasize or what is your focus you know one of my more popular talks is just talking about my journey as a writer because i'm pretty honest about it um not only the starting late in life bit which i you know i I talked a little bit about with you but i go into more detail but the failure you know that you know that led me to start over writing historical fiction people don't know that's just we're kind of conditioned not to talk about that but i find that that's what people want to hear, mm-hmm. you know, that, 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 that it's not like every author has a magic, you know, fairy godmother waving pixie dust over them and they write one book and bam, they're a New York times bestseller. It doesn't work that way. And um, for some of us, the road has been much harder and I like to talk about that and people like to hear that. And then beyond that, you know, I'll talk about a specific book um, if that's what they want, or I can talk about the research process a lot. Um, uh, you know, and talk about reading. I've done talks where I've talked about, you know, my lifelong love of reading and, and what that's done for me and how I think it's you know, informed my writing. Um, there are a lot of ways, you know, a lot of things to talk about. A lot of times, you know, it's driven by the organization. You know, they will have a specific thing they will want you to talk about. Exactly. So um, given what you write about and the characters and the real and imagined people you write about melanie um let's say you're organizing a dinner party what three literary figures whether dead or alive would would you uh not not necessarily literary but historical figures dead or alive uh, would you invite to your dinner party three oh wow so okay so uh historical figures dead or alive i would love to have mark twain jane austen and truman capote Uh ah wow that would be have plenty of of alcohol and plenty of laughter. A lot of wit. <laughs> a lot of wit. A lot of wit. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. you call yourself an armchair historian. Uh, do, you, do you mean just kind of a casual or uh, unofficial historian? I yeah. Mean, what do you mean by armchair? Well, I've always like an armchair history. quarterback, right? Yeah. I mean, I've always loved history. Um, and well, I, you know, didn't get a degree of anything. Um, I've always, I will read any biography that's out there, history that's out there, nonfiction. I mean, I really do. That's why it's been easy for me to write historical fiction, um, because when I finally realized what I wanted to write, there was I didn't have I had a really high level of background in for almost every era that I've written in, simply because I will just read all these weird histories. I mean, I just the most in I just love to sit on a rainy afternoon and read an obscure historical biography and then astound people at dinner parties with my wealth of information about things nobody else cares about. That's, right. that's me in a nutshell. Um, I love museums. I love historical markers by the roadside. I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I will say that my, I, I've been asked this a lot. I, for me, I have a specific time period that I'm most interested in. And I would say it kind of starts in the Victorian era up until about 1970. 
for me. I mean, I, I, I've read so much about everything that has gone on in the world and then, and also the civil wars kind of in there. Um, well, that's Victorian era as well. Um, mm-hmm. I am not a fan of like medieval or Tudors or ancient Rome or Greece. You know, I love the Madeline Miller books about ancient, you know, the, uh, about Greek mythology, but that's not my forte. And I would never write a book set in that era. Uh So So since you're a storyteller, I am curious what you're streaming these days and watching on Netflix and other premium networks or channels. Boy, lately it's not been a lot we finished up my husband and i do a lot of watching together i will be starting the crown season five yeah. i know it, we're it doing just, that tonight ourselves yeah yeah i know it just dropped so that'll be for sure one um you know we've been kind of heading to more lightness more things that make us happy we really really loved um somebody somewhere which was I can't even remember what platform it was on about a woman in, uh, who goes back to her hometown in Kansas um, to take care of her dying sister. And it sounds very sad, but it's not. It's, it's kind of a very uplifting, you know, very lovely series. We loved I, over the winter, we, we caught up on better things, which I had never seen. And I just was so moved by that. Um, we'll probably start White Lotus seeing the season two because we watched White Lotus season one. Mm-hmm. I love Abbott Elementary and it, it streams on Hulu, but it's on network TV and it's just wonderful. Um, very, very Schitt's Creek kind of, you know, it's a perfect mm-hmm. world where everybody's good, <laughs> 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 which are things that I'm kind of, you know, leaning towards. Now, I am not a big suspense streamer of things that right. are suspense or mystery. I don't, I've never really, I think Big Little Lies was the only kind of suspenseful mystery series I've ever mm-hmm. streamed. And I'm not yeah. a Game of Thrones fan. No, right. no, I'm not into right. that. No. Yeah. So uh, what are you reading right now? Do you have a book going, a novel? Well, I, I, I just got back from this research trip. Um, so I'm kind of immersed in this world and I can't really tell you what I've been reading because it would give too much away about the book, which I'm not allowed to say yet. Um, So I'm reading an awful lot of outer print books and biographies and histories, which is the fun part of this job um, because I get to read for a living. I mean, that's part of the research process, right? Um, Beyond that, I can tell you, I just finished On the Rooftop by Margaret Wilkerson's what was I saying? Sexton, Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. Mm. And it was just wonderful, kind of a taking, taking Fiddler on the Roof and Itevka and putting it into um, San Francisco in the 1950s, an area that is gentrifying and, and the residents of Black residents are being forced to leave and a mother and her three daughters and, and, and how they rebel against what she wants for them. And it was wonderful. And then I read a book that a lot of people really loved I did two remarkably bright creatures by Shelby Van Pelt mm-hmm. um, was partial, partially told from the point of view of an oct- octopus, which sounds weird, but it was incredibly good and moving. Um, so those were the, um, the last two really good novels that I've read. Well, I got to tell you, California gold in that, what you just told me about your, your next novel uh, coming out, um, in the middle of next year, August, August, we think. August of next year. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, that's uh, I love that that time period. I think it's going to be um, yeah. wonderful, and I'm going to wish you. you the best of luck on that. Our, our guest so has much. been Mel- Melanie Benjamin, and uh, best-selling historical uh, fiction writer. Melanie, thank you for taking the time. I very much appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mike. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for thinking of me, and um, what a delightful conversation we've had.